It's been a long journey rebuilding this transmission and an even longer journey trying to get all of these videos edited. But we're finally at the point where we can start putting it all back together. In between rebuilding each assembly, we've been keeping the parts packed away in order to keep them as clean as possible. For the transmission case, we simply bagged it up with a trash bag. All of the other parts we kept clean inside of storage containers. And we'll start unpacking everything now that we're ready to put it all back together. We'll start with the transmission case and get it bolted back down onto our stand to keep it vertical. And we also need to soak the low reverse clutches in oil as well as the 2-4 band. And as shown in a previous episode, we'll clean out all of the thrust bearings as well as possible. We'll basically just be dipping them in clean transmission fluid and running them around and around by hand. This should help break loose any contaminants and give everything a fresh coat of oil. We'll start by dropping in the rear ring gear to case thrust bearing. Then we'll apply some oil to the rear ring gear assembly and carefully drop it into the case. Be careful and don't force anything, once it lines up with the rear case bushing it should drop right into place. And with that in, we can make sure it spins freely. Next up, we have another thrust bearing, which goes in between the rear ring gear and the rear planetary assembly. And then we'll apply oil to all the moving parts, including the thrust bearing that's locked inside of the rear planetary assembly. It'll probably take a little bit of wiggling to get all of the gear teeth lined up, but it should slide into place easily. And then we'll double check again that everything is still spinning freely. And then we can slide the anti-clunk spring back into the case. Before installing anything, let's take a look at the new and old parts for the low roller clutch assembly. The new clutches and steels are the same thickness as the old ones. But, just to be sure we're not changing anything dramatically, there are 5 clutches and 5 steels in both the new and old clutch stacks. We'll set all the new clutches and steels onto the low roller clutch assembly, and compare the overall thicknesses of both. They appear to be completely identical, so we'll move on. We'll move on to installing this clutch stack into the case, and we're starting with the wave plate. And once that's lined up between the lugs, we'll drop in the first steel. The lugs on the steel need to be lined up with the lugs on the case, and the splines on the inside of each clutch disc need to be slotted into the outside of the rear planetary assembly. We'll continue dropping in steels and clutch discs until we have a stack of five of each inside the case. And once we double check that everything is fully installed and below the top edge of the rear planetary assembly, we can install the low roller clutch. This will also need some careful alignment to make sure the lugs on the rear planetary assembly match with those on the inside of the clutch. And once they do, we need to give everything a little bit of persuasion to get it below the snap ring groove. Now is also the time to double check that the anti-clunk spring is where it needs to be. And with that all looking good, we can go ahead and reinstall the snap ring for the low roller clutch. This is fairly easy to reinstall by hand, just by pushing along the outer edge until everything is clicked fully into place. And once we're sure the snap ring is fully seated, we can install the plastic thrust washer that installs below the sun shell. And we'll give the rear sun gear a thorough coating of oil and also drop that into place. And again, we'll check that everything is moving freely and that the parts are moving together as they should. As for the sun shell, we're actually going to be swapping out the factory unit for an aftermarket one commonly called the Beast. The sun shell is maybe the most famous weak point of the 4L60E. For many years, GM struggled with the heat treating of the factory units, and sooner or later either the splines would strip out or the whole spline area would crack off. Supposedly, GM actually fixed this in the late model transmissions and the sunshell in this thing should be pretty sturdy. But since we're in here anyway, we might as well replace it with the slightly beefier Beast model. Even if GM got the heat treating right on the newer models, the Beast still has thicker steel in the spline area. So we'll oil up the new sunshell and lower it into the case. We'll have to make sure that the splines get locked into the sun gear. And then another check to make sure everything still rotates freely. There's not really anything to locate the thrust bearing into place, so we'll just center it as well as we can for now. And now we're back to the front planetary carrier and ring gear. With these all cleaned up, we'll install the oiled thrust bearing between them, and then put the planetary assembly back inside of the carrier. And with those getting along nicely, we'll reinstall them into the case. We'll need to make sure that the splines are fully seated, and that the planetary carrier is fully inserted into the thrust bearing on top of the sun shell. And with that fully installed, again, we'll make sure everything is working properly. Next up, we'll oil the output shaft inside and out and get ready to install it into the case. To do this, we'll tip the whole thing forward just enough to get the output shaft slid into place. And then we can prop it up with a piece of wood from underneath and install the snap ring. 
and of course we'll double check to make sure it's fully inserted into its groove. And by turning the output shaft from outside of the case, we can see that everything is working properly. Next up is what has honestly to me been one of the hardest parts of rebuilding these transmissions, getting the input drum and reverse input drum back together. We'll apply some oil to both parts and then reinstall the selective washer and thrust bearing. And with those in place, all we have to do is get the reverse input drum lined up with the splines on the input drum. The trick is we have to line up all of the splines on all of the clutch discs on the reverse input drum with the splines on the outside of the input drum. On both this and the 700R4 rebuild, this certainly took some patience. There might be a technique to make this easier, but honestly, I don't know it. The best I've been able to figure out is to line up all the splines on the clutches by hand and center them in the drum as well as possible before placing the two drums together at a slight angle and applying a specific kind of downward pressure to get everything to fit together. You don't want to be too rough getting everything together because you don't want to bend any of the splines on the clutch discs. But in my experience, some manhandling and a whole lot of fiddling does appear to be necessary. If it's really driving you crazy, it can help to file the sharp point of the edge off of the splines on the input drum. Just be careful not to make a mess. And then eventually, when all the stars and clutch discs align, it should look like this, fully installed. The surface of the rear input drum should be level with the second Teflon ceiling ring. And now that we're finally ready to drop this assembly back into the case, we'll add some additional oil. This whole thing is heavy, so do be careful getting it into position. We'll basically hold the input turbine shaft and just kind of rattle everything around until it falls into place. Just be sure nothing catches on the reverse input drum and knocks the clutches out of position. And once it's fully installed, everything should turn nicely. The surface of the rear input drum should also be well below the pump gasket surface in the case. And now that that's done, we'll retrieve our band from its oil bath and get it into position. I find it easiest to get the end of the band with the angled piece of steel in between the drum and the case first. Then everything else will pretty much slide into place where it needs to be. So now the anchor pin end of the band is close, but we need to move it over a little bit just to get everything lined up exactly. And then we can put the band anchor pin in place. It'll probably need a little push while wiggling the band around to get it in place. And with that in, we'll double check that the other end of the band is where it's supposed to be. Everything is looking good, so we'll go ahead and get a new oil pump gasket and line it up with the holes in the case. We like to apply a little bit of oil to both sides of the gasket before installing it. In my experience, transmission assembly lube isn't really necessary, but I would recommend it for installing the oil pump thrust bushing, otherwise it can be pretty annoying. And with the oil pump on the bench, we'll give a thorough coating of oil to the seals as well as the bushings. Give the Teflon seals one last exam and center them as well as possible by hand before attempting to reinstall it and then we'll carefully lower the oil pump into position. If the ceiling rings are lined up correctly, it should not take much force to install it. If it feels like it's sticking or something's not quite right, don't risk it. Remove the oil pump, make sure the seals haven't been damaged, and then have another attempt at installation. It is very easy to damage these Teflon seals and they are quite vital to the operation of the transmission, so take your time with this step. And once it's fully seated, we'll also install the oil seal around the outside edge of the pump. Then we need to get the bolt holes on the oil pump aligned with the holes on the case. If you got it close while installing it, just use a screwdriver through the bolt holes to line it up by eye. If it's pretty far off, lift the oil pump up just enough to get it away from the gasket. It's not a good idea to turn the oil pump too much while it's pressing against the gasket because it risks tearing it. Once we have everything lined up, it's time to get the bolts ready to reinstall. These oil pumps are held to the case with seven bolts, and they're pretty special. They each have an o-ring underneath the head that seals them against the pump body. We'll use a pick to remove the o-ring from each of the bolts. And then we can oil up some new seals that came with the rebuild kit and install them onto the bolts. This can feel a little bit tedious, but it's extremely important to get these o-rings installed correctly to seal the front of the transmission. We'll apply a little bit of oil to the surfaces that the o-rings will seal against and then start threading all the bolts in. Once all the bolts have been installed loosely, we'll go around and snug them all up. And then we'll start tightening up all the bolts. We'll do so incrementally and in a crisscross pattern to make sure everything gets tightened down evenly and we're not warping the oil pump. We'll torque them down in several steps, reaching a final torque of 18 foot-pounds. And now that the oil pump is fully installed, we can recheck the main unit end play. We checked this during disassembly, and now we'll recheck it to make sure it's about the same number. Nothing that we did should have changed this number, so we're looking to see the same end play that it had before we took it apart. 
the end play measures right around 31 thousandths, which is about the same as it was before it came apart. And since that checks out, we'll go ahead and install the retainer for the front oil seal. We'll bend the tabs in just a little bit before installing it to make sure everything stays tight, and we'll align it on the front of the oil pump, and then we can gently hammer it into place. Next, we'll apply some oil to the o-ring groove in the input shaft, and then install a new oiled o-ring. Next, we'll move to the side of the case and oil the bore where the 2-4 servo will install. Then we can take the entire 2-4 servo assembly and slide it into place. Once it's mostly installed, we'll give it a push to get the servo cover o-ring most of the way into the groove. For this next part, we need to compress the servo cover even more to get the snap ring into place. A large pair of channel lock pliers hooked into the inside of the oil pan sealing surface works great. In this case, it needed a little more encouragement to get the servo cover fully into place. Then we can slide in the servo cover snap ring and make sure it gets fully installed. This was easily accomplished using the rubber mallet and a large flat blade screwdriver. And then we'll take a close up look to make sure the snap ring is in its groove all the way around. If this groove wasn't cleared out and it's an older transmission with a rustier snap ring, it would be a good idea to clean things up before installing it. Unless you have the right tool for it, you can also use the channel locks to push in on the servo cover and get a good idea of the servo clearance. And with the servo installed, we're going to go ahead and remove the transmission from the stand. We'll remove the bolts and then kind of just tip it over onto the workbench. At this point, it's still not its full weight, but it's quite heavy, so be careful. For now, we're going to work on it with the oil pan surface facing up. The next major step will be to get the valve body installed, so we'll go ahead and set things up for that. First up, we'll remove the old square cut rubber seal from the 3-4 accumulator piston, and then we'll oil up and install a new one. We'll add even more oil to the piston and the bore in the case, and then slide in the accumulator pin. Then we'll cut the accumulator piston in place and press it down into the bore. With that fully installed, we can drop in the 3-4 accumulator spring. Then we'll add a little bit of oil to this pocket and drop in the check ball. Now we need to get the old gaskets and filters off of the valve body separator. To remove these filters, all we'll do is squeeze the tabs together with needle nose pliers and pull them away from the separator plate. Then we'll very carefully peel the old gaskets away from the separator plate. In this case, probably since the transmission isn't that old, we were very lucky and the gaskets came off without a fight. Then we'll spray the separator plate down with brake clean and get it nice and shiny. Of course, we'll do this on both sides. And now that it's sparkling clean, we can install new filters to the separator plate. And with both of those snapped into place, we can take a look at the new separator plate gaskets. One gasket is marked CA, indicating it is the case side gasket, and one is marked VB, indicating it is the valve body side gasket. We'll place the case gasket up against the case and make sure everything lines up. If there's an open port on the separator plate that's not on the separator plate gasket, that is probably going to cause some weird issues. Since everything matches up on ours, we'll go ahead and install the separator plate and the valve body side gasket. Then we'll drop on the stiffener plate and get the bolts for that threaded in. Then we need to get all of the valve body side check balls installed. It's important to get all of these back where they came from, so check and double check that everything is where it needs to be. So now that we're sure we have all seven valve body side check balls in place, we'll move on to the 1-2 accumulator housing. The easiest way to get this piston out of the housing is to apply a little bit of compressed air to this port to push it out. Just be sure to hold onto the piston and not use too much air, otherwise you'll probably never see it again. With the piston loose, we can remove it from the housing as well as the spring underneath it. Then we'll carefully remove the seal from the piston, clean it all up, and install a new oiled square cut seal. We'll also clean up the housing and then apply some oil to the inside of the bore. We'll drop the spring back into place and then press the piston back into the bore. Make sure the piston gets installed in the same direction it came out. And now we can hold our assembled housing in place over the separator plate and thread in the three bolts. Once those are finger tight, we'll go ahead and snug them down as well as the three bolts for the stiffener plate. Then we'll go back through and torque them all to spec. Then we'll clean up the wiring loom from inside the transmission. We'll especially give the case connector a good cleaning because there's still a fair amount of dirt on it. Then we'll remove the old o-ring from it and install a new oiled one. And we'll do the same for the torque converter clutch solenoid, replacing its old o-ring. There's also a filter screen within the torque converter clutch solenoid that can be removed with needle nose pliers to be replaced. Then we'll go through and make sure there's oil applied to all of the check balls. 
We'll apply some oil to the case connector bore as well as the torque converter clutch solenoid bore. Then we'll get those two things installed into the case. The case connector is a tight fit, so once it's lined up with the case, we'll give it a few taps to get it fully seated. And then we'll press the torque converter clutch solenoid into the oil pump. Once it's seated, we can install the bolts for it and torque them to spec. Then we'll make sure the wiring loom is flipped out of the way because it's time to install the valve body. We'll also install the manual valve link to the shift lever because that has to be inserted into the manual valve as everything is installed. So we'll get the valve body in place, get that manual valve link inserted without dropping anything or knocking any check balls out of place, give everything one last once over to make sure things are where they need to be, and then drop the valve body onto the separator plate. Then we can flip the wiring loom back onto the valve body and hook up the electrical connectors. And once the pressure control solenoid, torque converter clutch solenoid, 3-2 shift solenoid, input speed sensor, and the 2-3 and 1-2 shift solenoids are all connected, we can reinstall our fluid pressure manifold switch that we replace the seals on. We can hook up the electrical connector, make sure everything's lined up, and set it in place. Then we'll get all five bolts for it threaded in and tightened until just before they make contact. Now it's time to get all of the valve body bolts reinstalled. Remember that there are multiple different types, so make sure you're installing the right one in the right location. A few of the threaded holes in the case go all the way through, and catastrophic results could ensue if too long a bolt is installed there. Once all the bolts have been started, we'll go around and get them all snugged down. Then we'll finally go around and torque all of them down. We'll tighten them down in an outward spiraling pattern in two passes to make sure that they're all evenly torqued to spec. Through this process we're tightening all of the bolts we just installed as well as the five that go through the pressure manifold switch. And once all of those are finally torqued to spec, we can drop in the manual shift lever detent spring. Just like when loosening it, pushing down a little bit can make it much easier to install. We'll snug that down and then torque it to spec. We'll also get the wiring loom fully clicked into place and make sure it's where it needs to be. Then we can apply oil to a new dipstick seal and slide it into the case. We'll also apply oil to a new filter seal and carefully use a socket to hammer it in. Once the seal is about flush to the surface of the oil pump, it's fully installed. Then we'll apply a little bit of oil to the neck of the oil filter and twist it into the case. Sometimes these also need a little bit of extra persuasion. You can tell it's fully installed once it's sitting completely against the valve body. And that's pretty much everything in the bottom of the transmission. The next step is to reinstall the oil pan. And now we'll take a bit of a detour, but we'll try to keep this brief. Whenever I remove a transmission's oil pan, I like to install a drain plug, cause it sucks draining the fluid out with that one. What we've done in the past is simply drill a hole in the oil pan and weld a nut on the inside of it, and then use an aluminum washer on a bolt on the outside to keep it sealed. Doing it that way does mean it's impossible to drain all of the oil out of the transmission pan, but it certainly gets the majority of it. It never bothered me, but some people had suggested to cut notches into the nut or lift it off the surface when welding it so it could drain all of the fluid out. We actually tried that on this transmission pan, and that was a mistake. By not welding the nut all the way around, the heat from welding warped the bottom of the pan, and then every time we tried to tighten a drain plug into it, it warped it more and more. Long story short, we weren't able to make that seal and can't recommend that method. We ended up welding a washer on the outside so the bolt at least had a nice flat surface to seal against, but then a little bit of fluid still seeped out around the edge of the washer where the weld was, and we kind of just slathered JB Weld on the outside of it to keep it from leaking. After going through all that, leaving about a quarter inch of fluid on the bottom of the pan seems like a non-issue. So long story short, we ended up with a transmission plug that kind of drains the transmission all the time, but whatever. Back to reassembly. We'll clean up the transmission pan magnet as well as we can and stick it back to the pan. Then we'll apply a light coat of oil to the pan gasket sealing surface on the pan and on the transmission. We'll be using the cork rubber oil pan gasket that came with the rebuild kit. I've had issues with other types, but never had an issue with this type of gasket, so it really is my go-to. And once the gasket is all lined up, we can drop the oil pan into place. Then we'll thread in the 16 oil pan bolts. We'll put a little bit of oil in the threads of each bolt and get them all finger tight. Then we'll go in a loose crisscross pattern and snug down each of the bolts. We'll come back through and tighten the bolts in a crisscross pattern over two or three passes. What I'll usually try to do is tighten the bolts to within maybe 50 inch pounds of the torque spec, wait half an hour and then come back and do another pass at the full torque spec. 
And once those are all tight, we're done with the bottom of the transmission, so we're going to go ahead and flip it over onto the workbench. The next step is to reinstall the removable bell housing. With this type of oil pump seal, tightening down the bell housing on top of it will compress it into place. We also probably should have installed the bell housing before the oil pan seal because there's a little bit of the edge of the gasket that's actually squished out and is in the way. But that's no problem, we'll just trim that off and keep moving. And with that out of the way, and a clean flange surface, we can place the bell housing back onto the transmission. The oil pump is what centers the bell housing, but it does have a little bit of play left to right. Just try to get everything centered as possible, and get all the bolts threaded in before tightening anything down. We'll put a bit of blue Loctite on each of these bolts, and tighten them down using a Torx Plus socket. Once they're all snug, we'll go around in two passes and torque them all to spec. These bolts need to be pretty tight, so keep the extension and torque wrench as straight as possible. And once those are all torqued down, the bell housing is securely attached. The next thing we need to do is reattach the shift cable bracket. We'll put anti-seize on the threads of each bolt, and then tighten them down. Then we can reinstall the range position switch. As long as this wasn't turned after it was removed from the transmission, it should slide right back into place and be in the right slot. We don't want to apply a lot of force, but it is resisting sliding over that slightly rusted shaft. What we'll do is use a socket to push on the inside of the switch to get it lined up without forcing the body to bend. Then once that's in place, we'll put a little bit of anti-seize on the shift lever and install it onto the shaft. We'll install the shift linkage nut and torque it to spec. Then we'll put some anti-seize on the threads on the hold down bolts for the range select switch. And, once those are nice and tight, we can manually move the shift linkage and make sure it moves through all positions. Instead of reinstalling the plug to this pressure port, we're going to install this 90 degree angle adapter and a hose so that we can hook a gauge up to it. That way, for the first startup, we can see exactly what the transmission pressures are in every gear. It's a very good idea to use a gauge to monitor transmission pressures after a rebuild. Depending on the vehicle, it can be pretty difficult to remove this fitting and the gauge hose once everything is installed into the vehicle, but I think it's worth it for the peace of mind. And next up is the torque converter. This is a remanufactured unit, but it should be the same as the one that came out of the truck. It used to be a standard practice to perform a torque converter flush for every rebuild, but now remanufactured torque converters are available for so cheap, what's usually done is the whole torque converter is just replaced. Since the old one is low mileage and there actually wasn't anything wrong with this transmission, I'm sure it's fine, so I'm going to hang on to it and probably use it for something in the future, but since I already had this remanufactured unit on hand, we might as well use it and have nice clean fluid everywhere. Before using it, we'll use brake cleaner to clean up the snout area as much as possible. Then we'll pre-fill it with transmission fluid. The amount of fluid these hold will vary, and you're not going to be able to fill it all the way up on the bench, so just put as much in there as possible before installing it. Then, we'll use more oil and apply it to the front seal and stator shaft on the transmission. We'll also apply some to the snout on the torque converter. To make it easier to hold onto the torque converter while installing it, we thread it in studs. And then once everything is lined up, just keep turning the torque converter and pushing it back towards the transmission until you've heard three clicks. There won't always be three because sometimes things line up and two of those clicks will happen at the same time. Just make sure that the torque converter is fully installed. This can vary with certain applications, but on this torque converter in this transmission, the distance from the front of the bell housing to the bolt hole flange on the torque converter was just about an inch. Then we'll go ahead and unthread all the studs from the torque converter. And just for good measure, I like to zip tie it to something on the front of the bell housing to keep it from possibly sliding around when being installed. So we'll put a zip tie through the inspection cover hole and tighten it down. And just like that, this long transmission build series is done. It's back together. However, if you'll think back a couple episodes and remember what we talked about before taking it apart, there really wasn't anything wrong with the transmission. But there was definitely something wrong in the driveline on the truck. When draining everything, we noticed a significant amount of metal shavings in the transfer case. So while the transmission itself is back together, we're not done with this job just yet.